Welcome to the Northern Electric Vehicle Experience podcast, now available on YouTube. Um, today we're going to talk about electric vehicle FUD, that's fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And there seems to be a massive wave coming through right now. Let's talk about FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, this is something that opposition groups to a whatever, and in this case, electric vehicles, um, they try to sow a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt into their opposites, to the people or thing that they're opposing. And they do this in a number of ways. Usually, in the case of electric vehicles, they try to get you scared of its range. Um, they try to make EV charging super complicated. They try to uh, say that the batteries are going to destroy the planet or that mining for the batteries will destroy the planet. Um, there's a lot of that sort of thing goes on, but it all amounts to fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And for those that don't educate themselves, they don't uh, look a bit deeper than the headlines, than the thumbnail, um, they, they can often get hoodwinked into believing some of the stuff. That's not to say that there isn't a grain of truth within that, um, but it is vastly overblown and it's never put into context. So I'm glad you're with me and I'm going to try to um, both validate some of the concerns and, and, and put it into the context it deserves because it is, uh, it is being blown out of proportion. Uh, lately I've been seeing a lot and one thing that comes to mind that I, I heard recently, it was on a radio interview with uh, with a politician. I'll, I'll just leave out the political stripes because to be honest, everywhere you go in the world, there is going to be some political group or politician, uh, never mind the label, right wing, left wing, center, green, not green, it doesn't matter. There's always gonna be somebody that's trying to stoke uh, a base of support uh, against EVs and for their election or, or maintaining an office. This particular person was speaking to a reporter doing a, hey, I'm uh, walking around my, my constituency and talking a bit about this and that. And he, of course, slipped in there how back, you know, EVs are not the answer and they're a big problem or they're not ready for prime time yet. And his example was that he had a Perfectly new EV. He loved his EV. It was great. Lots of fun to drive. Really good pickup. Um, all that's true. But he drew the line when, and he realized that, this is what he said, that it was not ready for prime time when he got stranded on the side of the highway by a charger with his two young children. This is a rest stop in Ontario beside the highway. They got McDonald's in there, Burger King, Starbucks, real hardship place. Um, got stuck beside the highway because the charger there was not yet hooked up or was broken. Um, and he had no way to get power. First of all, he ended up there with obviously nothing in the tank. Um, and I've been driving my EV for six and a half years now, have never run out of power. Came close a couple times through my own stupidity, but I don't try to pretend that's the EV's fault. I did run out of gas several times. Also my fault. This guy was trying to say that you could end up in this exact same situation and it is fear inducing. With your young children, you could be stranded without transportation if you don't, you know, if you get an EV. Well, the truth is he obviously was not paying attention if this even happened. Um, he was not paying attention. He did not verify his chargers were available. Those side of the highway chargers, there are two to four chargers per location. Um, there should be more obviously, but there's two to four per location. My guess is he went to one of the brand new Ivy ones because he did identify Ivy, uh, that had not yet been hooked up yet. Now, if you drive past it and you don't pay attention, you might think it's working. But if you're an EV driver and you're going on a long drive and you need to charge, 
don't you use your head and check the Ivy app or the app for, you know, Electrify America, Charge Points, whomever, Flow, whoever you're going to, and make sure their charger is working or pick a different location or have a backup plan? No, you don't just go there blindly hoping for the best. No, uh, even with gas cars, you have to make sure that there are gas stations. In the city, there's lots. In the burbs, there's even more. But when you start getting out in the boondocks, you can run out of gas before you get to the next gas station. you got to use your head for more than a hat rack. But uh, there, here's that kernel of truth. Uh, I don't think there's anywhere in the world yet, except for maybe Norway, probably not even Norway, that has enough chargers yet. That keeps the uptime up enough for it to be a really reliable network. So there's a lot of work to be done. I should be able to rely on that charger being uh, operating, working, good condition. I should not be having to deal with situations where uh, I get to a charger and it is dead, right? That just shouldn't happen. Uh, but it can and it does. Now, if that charger set up and, uh, and no knocks on Ivy. Ivy's a good outfit. They do a great job. I have never found one to be not working. Um, they have a lot of lower power chargers, but they work. And they work most pretty much every time. As far as I've seen, I've never, for one, I've never failed to be charged there. Um, but if this was Tesla, there would have been a minimum of eight chargers there. So if one is down, there's still five more. You know, this is kind of where we need to be going. we got to stop putting in onesies and twosies of chargers and start putting in 8, 12, 16, 24. You know, let's, uh, let's start getting into real numbers because um, these small numbers are not going to cut it, especially by the highway. In the middle of nowhere, sure, there's one on a spider web of, of a network um, to, to just solve an area. But on a major highway, He's talking the 401 by Trenton. Uh, if you don't know the area, the 401 is the main highway that goes across southern Ontario. In the city of Toronto, it is 16 to 20 lanes wide. There's millions of cars on that road. And you want to put two chargers beside it? Come on, get real. Um... There's other things that have been going on. I, saw, I read an article about a what I would call a bogus or half-baked study um, where, and I forget, uh, was it Forbes? Yeah, I can't swear to it. But uh, I saw it repeated in several articles, both uh, conventional news, YouTube, um, print, um, and the... The study went basically like this. It costs more to, uh, to drive 100 miles in an EV and, than it does in a, in a gas car, in an ICE car. Um, anyone who knows anything about EVs uh, knows that's moronic. It, it is absolutely not true. Um, but if you pick and choose enough, you can get there. And if you read the study, and I did that, um, you will find that if you read the actual study, not just the, the reporter's extrapolation from the study, you will find that uh, the study does acknowledge that, uh, by and large, it's usually cheaper to, to take an EV to go from point A to point B, especially if you charge at home and especially if you get a reasonably good rate for charging at home. However, if you're in certain states that have ridiculously high home charging costs, or you have to charge at fast chargers all the time, and you pay the maximum absolute top rate for that charging, um, then you could theoretically pay more, uh, especially when you add in the cost of the chargers for your home and on the road. Um, if you include, you know, the original cost of the vehicle being more than a similarly sized gas car, um, yeah, you might get up to more. 
but of course, the study does not take into account that you almost never have to do any kind of a service on these vehicles, like no oil and filter change for 150 bucks every 5,000 kilometers, right? No, you don't have to do that. And you don't, oh, sorry, I'm talking Volkswagen uh, oil and filter charges. Uh, they're a bit exorbitant, but yeah, you can get it for, you know, 80 bucks. I'm talking Canadian dollars. Um, if you go to one of those Jiffy Lubes or something, um, but you're, you're not talking, you, you know, all those costs aren't there. Your repair costs. I have 220,000 kilometers on my car now. Um, and I've had to do, well, basically nothing to that car. I've had to do brakes. I've had to do tires. I've had to do... Uh, I got a bit of road damage. My under underbody protection thing, a plastic doodad. Uh, I had to do that, and my 12 volt battery. It didn't need to be replaced, but it's six years old. I thought I told him, "Hey, just change that at the same time." That's about the whole of all my repairs: tires, brakes, bit of road damage. That's it. I did have to do a warranty claim on my rearview mirrors same one as in a cruise so i don't see the problem there and um the battery of course it's a bolt and they had the battery fire thing and gm under warranty changed them all so thank you gm you gave me basically an entirely new drive frame at 160,000 kilometers thank you very much i'll take it but all that said is my car is going to operate for years to come Touch wood. Where's the wood? Oh, there's some wood. All right. Um, is going to operate well for years to come. And I won't have exorbitant costs uh, associated with it. I charge at home. Now I'm in New Brunswick. It's about 12 cents a kilowatt. And uh, maybe they'll eventually bring in uh, time of use rates and I can charge for cheaper at night like I did in Ontario. Um, but on the whole, not a problem and far, far, far cheaper than gasoline. And when you look at the price of gas, which is, by the way, something that they did compare a little bit, but, you know, they were comparing kind of econo box gas cars to to EVs. And they were they're muddying it around because it's like, you know, is this a Yukon Denali suburban F-150 pickup truck uh, gas consumption rate, or is it a, uh, a Chevy Spark, you know, fuel consumption rate from the, you know, 90s? Um, it's, it's not really fair uh, comparisons, and they didn't put in all the details in the reporting. In the study, yes. They covered it. In the reporting, they basically took the best gasoline rate to the worst accumulated EV rate. And, oh, look, it could be more. Well, you know what? If I drive a Toyota Corolla or if I drive a Suburban, my fuel economy rate is going to be a bit different. So keep that in mind when you're reading these articles and dig deeper. If you have to scratch your head for a second and go, hmm, that doesn't sound quite right. Everybody says EVs are cheaper to drive around. Uh, more expensive to buy for sure, but cheaper to drive around. And this article saying they're not? Dig deeper. You might find you're surprised. Then there's this old chestnut. The grid will melt down if we all go to EVs. The grid will utterly collapse. Now, I've covered this before, and frankly, it's not true. Um, the utilities will say, um, uh, without a doubt, they'll say that, um, you need to be cognizant of, of the issues. You need to be aware, uh, of, of the charging structure. You've got to know what your transformers are, your lines are, how old are they? You know, can they, if this entire zone uh, that that gets fed off of this transformer, uh, starts bringing in EVs, um, can this transformer handle that load? 
Yes, no, maybe so. Um, but this is renewal work. Um, they make it sound like they have to transform the entire grid to satisfy EVs. The truth is, it's just renewal. Um, if you go back to the 70s and 60s, um, I don't know about everywhere else in the world, but here in Canada, uh, they were big on electric heat. So a lot of the homes out there were built for electric baseboard heating. That is not insubstantial heating. That is massive power. And then they had electric ranges, or electric ovens, dryers, fridges, air conditioners, all at much higher draw than current uh, equipment. So a lot of the houses, housing stock that's out there was already built for electric heat. Same with the transformers, the main lines. That was all built for much higher capacity electric draw than we did in the intervening period. Now we've gotten our electric usage way down, LEDs, more fuel, more efficient appliances, um, all that kind of thing. A lot of people are bringing in heat pumps or they're using gas for their heating. Um, that is going to change how things work, or that's going to, that reduces the amount of electricity you use for your other stuff, and it will allow for you to hook up your car. Now, one of the big issues with hooking up a car is, say it's empty and you plug it in in the garage, and it's eight hours of continuous high amperage draw, continuous 40, 45 amp draw to power that car. That is a lot, but it's well within the capacities and capabilities of your electrical system, particularly if you do it overnight, when all your other draws go to minimal, but your EV draw is now at maximum. The grid also, it's used to operating during the day. The day is maximum draw. That's all the businesses, factories, homes, schools, offices, whatever, subways, all drawing during the day. All that goes down at night, reduced in some cases, outright off in others. Now, if EVs are charging at night, doesn't that kind of balance that load? Absolutely it does. So if you actually look at some videos done by real um, utility planners, they're going to say they're actually looking forward to some of the EV changes. And a lot of that is uh, because that balance is there. Nighttime charging balances out daytime charging. For a grid, balance is best. It's the ups and downs that give them hard times. Now, admittedly, when an EV plugs in or hundreds of thousands of them plug in, that's a big up. Um, and they've got to compensate for those things, and they're going to figure it out. But that's all it is. It's a mathematical engineering exercise. And yes, they're going to have to put money into that. But they have to anyways. If they're going to build a new uh, auto manufacturing plant or steel smelting plant, they got to figure that out too, don't they? New condo building goes in, they have to figure that out too. It all matters. It all gets figured out. Um, a bit more relevant is where does all the power come from? Some of that will be solved through time shifting. Others will be solved through um, uh, new generation capacity and green generation capacity. That, that interim period where we're trying to get off carbon generation and onto renewable or carbon-free generation, maybe uh, micro-nuclear or whatever it is, um, that's going to be a difficult period, and we've got to kick ourselves in the butt and uh, get going on that. But it is all manageable. It's not new stuff to us. We've been doing electricity for a couple hundred years now. We can figure this out. We got this. Why is this FUD out there? The truth is that FUD is being put out there for a couple of reasons. Vested interests, oil, gas, fossil fuels, coal, they don't want the grave train to end. And they're pushing out their, this kind of stuff. They're funding kind of BS studies. They're getting their talking heads, um, saying things that are anti-EV. Um, and they just, they're just trying to keep their money, their gravy train rolling. 
And I get that. But I do find it somewhat despicable considering um, the state of the planet and where we have to get from, from and to. So uh, I think they need to, I think they need to dial it back and make sure that they, they take everything into consideration and not just what they want to do. Another area is just outright change. Human beings are largely resistant to change uh, unless they're excited about something. I don't know why some people are not excited about EVs. You throw them a new iPhone, they line up around a block. But uh, an EV, no, that's not exciting, even though they're far more interesting than any iPhone. And they are a game changer. They're revolutionary compared to ICE vehicles. I appreciate them. I like them. And I think it's... Uh, I think it's a great driving experience. It's a much better vehicle. Yes, there's still some challenges, especially in the towing department. But, you know, we're down to just about that, towing. Um, EV charging has gotten way faster. You're now down to, with some models and probably all of them not too far down the road, you're going to be um, uh, in a situation where, like the Ionic 5, 10 to 80% with the appropriate charger and all that in 18 minutes. Well, they're all working towards that. They're all pretty much in the 30 to 40 minute range, um, but all the new ones. Um, but the bigger vehicles, uh, especially like the towing vehicles, they're going to need to have that really fast charging. But these are technical problems that are being solved. If you think about it, modern EVs aren't much more than 10 years old, maybe 15 on the outside. Um, and that's a pretty young industry. And they're already almost at par with EVs because I'd say they're beyond, uh, sorry, ICE vehicles yet. Uh, with those couple of exceptions, particularly around towing, um, the ICE vehicles kind of win there uh, for now. But it's what, a couple of years, three years away, and that won't be the case anymore. Um, it's time, it's time to make the shift, and it's time for people to to get on board, to check it out, to try it out. If you've never, if you've never actually driven an EV, and you think you don't like it, you hate it, you've fallen into the crowd that says, EVs are terrible. Why on earth would you want one of these things? Take one out for a test drive. Know somebody that has one, let them take you out for a drive. They're far nicer vehicles to drive. Way better to drive. Way more fun to drive. Way more pleasant to drive. To wrap this up, if you thought this uh, information that I've provided was of value, please hit that like button. And if you want to see more of it, subscribe. Uh, I appreciate having you here. It is really good to be back in, in the, uh, I, I keep wanting to say podcasting game, but now it's on YouTube. It, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a visual medium as well as a, as a, uh, as an audio medium. So, um, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to have you with me and I hope to provide you more content going forward. Please submit, uh, your suggestions, make your comments suggest in the comments, uh, check out the uh, podcast channel in there. You'll be able to leave a voice note, which I might use on, on the channel. If you do that, uh, be aware, I will use your, uh, voice notes in the channel if they're, uh, if they're useful to me. Thank you for, for joining me and see you again soon.